Merry Christmas to you. We're in that season of uh, joy and mirth, at least for most people. <laughs> yeah. Is that, um, Jared, do you have anything to do with that? Is that your daughter? <laughs> so this uh, Christmas season, it's where at least once a year we kind of turn our attention and our thoughts towards uh, Christmas. And uh, it's kind of a warm, fuzzy occasion in which we enjoy uh, a lot of the traditions and so forth that go on during this year. Uh, my problem is I read a book a long time ago that kind of um, ruined for me the whole Christmas thing. So, um, and then um, I started looking up Christmas in the Bible and except for the birth of Jesus Christ, I couldn't find any of the other stuff that we do. Um, so it, it lost a little bit of its pizzazz and excitement and, and, and even for our family. Uh, our, my kids, now that they've left home, they, can, they have all their own traditions. They don't have to be stuck with their, their, their dad. And, uh, but <clears throat> since then, though, I've, I've come to appreciate the truth that's represented in Christmas, although I find that the holiday has... Uh, a lot leaves a lot to be desired. There's certainly a truth that's in Christmas that we rarely ever, at least as far as the public at, in general ever, <laughs> ever takes any, pays any attention to. I, I've also come to appreciate how this truth of the incarnation of, of Jesus Christ has, um, it's, it's come to be seen in certain traditions that we practice. So, as a result, then, I, I've, for me personally, and, I, and you certainly don't have to copy me by any means, for me personally, the whole Christmas thing is just, I, I, I'm not a big fan of it, but I really do enjoy the fact that this is a time when we are, at least in churches, are supposed to reflect on the fact that God was born as a baby in Bethlehem. So I think it's my responsibility, then, as a pastor to point us in that direction, because, <clears throat> fortunately, we live in Taiwan, and in Taiwan, the big holiday is Chinese New Year. I'm all for that. You can celebrate Chinese New Year as much as you want. Um, have a blast. And, and so we do have some decorations here. There are certain decorations we don't have in a church. Like, we don't have a Christmas tree here. I, I, I just, I, I, it just goes against, goes against the Grinch in me, I guess. Or it goes, uh, so... <laughs> There's a whole lot of things that, that are celebrated as the Christ Mass that we don't, that we don't do here. I, I'm not going to tell you the name of the book because I don't want to ruin your Christmas. But um, the thing that we need to understand is we need to be careful that traditions don't cloud our minds to what the truth is. It's always good at this time of year to examine our traditions to be sure they pinpoint what the birth of Jesus Christ is all about. So each year, I mean every year, I struggle through this thing with what to do with this holiday. And I oftentimes, it's at this time of year, I ask God, well, why did you make me a pastor anyway? And, and because uh, everybody else believes in it, and I don't. And I'm, I, I'm supposed to be a pastor, and I'm supposed to join in, in the whole season. So here's what we're going to do. I've learned that uh, there's a certain pragmatism that goes along with celebrating certain traditions. And so I'm going to, I'm going to hold on to the practical aspect of it and uh, leave the other arguments to go to another day. So on another hand, on this, I, I'd really like for us to take some time to reflect on a biblical truth of the incarnation. The biblical truth of the incarnation. Uh, I know we celebrate December 25th and, and uh, okay. Uh, so let's, I'm, I'm trying to keep focused here. Um, I want us to think about what we're saying when we talk about the fact that God, the creator of this universe, stepped out from wherever he was at and entered into a human body. I, I, honestly, folks, that has to be the most astounding thing that a person could ever say. Why? I mean, my first question is, why in the world would God want to do that? I've often wondered, after Adam and Eve sinned and the creation of God fell, was broken, 
why he didn't just push the reset button and say, I'm going to start all over again. But for whatever reason, God decided that he was going to invest in us. And it wasn't going to be a casual investment where he's out there and he kind of throws things at us and sees what we could do with it. He says, I'm going to live among them. I, if I was not a believer, you'd have a hard time convincing me. But since I am a believer, <laughs> what am I going to do? So because it just is, it's a fantastic story. We, we talk rather glibly and we sing about this whole virgin birth thing. Come on, folks, are you kidding me? How many times in the, we've got, what, 5 billion people or so that live on earth. How many of the 5 billion have actually experienced a birth, a virgin birth? Of course, half of those won't because they're men, so, you know, it's not a problem there. <clears throat> but you think, in, you, you, you think over the course of history from the beginning of time, whether some people think Time is only about 6,000 years old. Some say that time goes millions of years. But think about it, folks. Let's say it's uh, whatever choice you want to make on that. I prefer the 6,000 myself. But, but uh, in all that time, in every single birth except for one, every child came about through the consummation of an act between a man and a woman. And here we're talking about and celebrating, and which we've done for hundreds of years now, this fact that a, a baby was born of a virgin. And I, it's, it's amazing that the great mind of the creator who created all these things that we see, that he decided that he was going to become one of us and dwell amongst us. And so we have this incarnation. Incarnation is the union of the divine with the, uh, the human. It's where we say the divine and the human come together in a person called Jesus of Nazareth. So uh, you can go back, back one slide there. <clears throat> the picture is of a young woman and a baby. And the billions of times that this has happened... Never once, except for our record that we have in the scriptures, has it been recorded that it ever happened through a virgin birth. And really, uh, there's, there's some well-known theologians who question whether or not the virgin birth was a fact or whether it's just something that, that uh, helps us in our religion to, to believe that Jesus Christ is the only one. I'm not going to go into the whole theology of that thing because there is a good, solid theological stand for it. But it's, I just want us to, 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 again, think as a biblical teaching, incarnation refers to the affirmation that God, in one of the modes of his existence as a trinity of three in one, and without in any way ceasing to be the one true God, he revealed himself to humanity for our salvation by becoming a human. Jesus, the man from Nazareth, is the incarnate word or son of God. He's the focus of this God-human encounter. As the God-man, he mediates God to us. As the man-God, he represents humans to God. And by this faith union with Jesus, we humans then, as adopted children of God, we participate in the filial relationship with Father God. Now, that's a, mind, that's a, 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 a huge mouthful, but because of the union of God-man and what Jesus Christ has done today, as a blood-bought and a blood-washed child of God, I can say I am. I, I can say I am a child of God, and I can say God is my Father. The sad thing is that in much of the world, that's a difficult thing to say, that people choke on saying something nice about their father. But the fact is, God has always wanted to have this relationship with his creation. In order to have this relationship with the creation, he had to become one of us. And so the question is, how, how does the infinite... How does the infinite creator God fit into the skin of a, of a finite 
human being. Do you know what the difference is between the finite and the infinite? It's a vast gulf that cannot be, it, it cannot be broached. It cannot be crossed. God's the only one who could step from the infinite into the finite. I know there's those religions who say that there are good men, and, and, and other religions also speak of the uh, incarnation. For example, Hindus believe in the incarnation of Vishnu, of whom some Buddhists consider, uh, and some Buddhists then consider Buddha to be uh, human form. The Egyptians viewed the pharaohs as incarnation of the god Re, and several other ancient peoples believed that their kings were divine. So it's nothing new, but it's the concept, folks. The thing is, we, we, we talk about these things as if they're everyday stuff, you know, like it happens all the time. And it doesn't happen all the time. It's a, it's a concept that's absolutely impossible. In fact, is, in fact, it's impossible for us to conceive how it could happen that the infinite God could, in fact, become a little bitty baby born in a tiny town of Bethlehem to a young teenage virgin. I, I, I just really think it would be good for us to pause and to think about how fantastic that is, how absolutely incredible and indeed inconceivable it is. No pun indeed in, intended. <clears throat> Here's what the Bible says. The Apostle John is adamant that Jesus is God's permanent and only incarnation. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. The union of God and humanity, becoming his own creation, to redeem us, to save his creation from self-destruction. I mean, come on. That's huge. It's like a big wow that, that God would, would do such a thing. We, we have in our record now, in the Bible record that we have, one who is called Jesus. He's called Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the sacrifice. And not only is, is Jesus God in human flesh, but he came to die. He didn't come to rule. He didn't come to overwhelm us. He, he came to dwell amongst us that he might die for us, that we might be lifted up to join him. Honestly, that is not a human concept. We don't, we don't give ourselves, we rarely give ourselves to die for something great. There are people who do. But for something that's broken and fallen, something that needs to be uh, uh, fixed and, and there's a fundamentally a, a, a flaw in the core, God came to, to restore us. He, he comes not only to die for us and not simply to, to cleanse us, but he comes to us, get this, Creator, maker of the universe comes to us that he might then become our sin. So that he could take the very worst of us. So he could take the very, uh, the, the, the central core of our rottenness and say, I will take that. Make that mine. I'll own it. I'll embrace it. I'll be sin for you. And in exchange... I will give you what I always wanted you to be, righteous, pure, holy. God, God came among us. He came to take our punishment, to take our condemnation. I say all that because during this time, you know, it's, it's a warm, pleasant time. And we, we have good times of fellowship and we enjoy the, 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 the um, Christmas season. Typically, people are happy during this time, especially as long as you're spending money. It makes more people happy, so spend more money and make more people happy. But that's the point, you see, that, that, that uh, it's become so distorted because for Jesus, it was the other way around. It was he, he sacrificed everything and became the worst that we might 
be the best. So as God in human flesh, he suffered the divine penalty for sin as an innocent substitute. Being both God and man, Jesus then simultaneously revealed God's will for human life. And he reconciled sinful people to God through his own perfect life and death. Because of the incarnation, therefore, those who believe in Jesus Christ have peace with God and new life from God. How can that happen? It can only happen in the incarnation. Yesterday, I um, was um, going through this, uh, this salvation plan about how, and usually I use the illustration of the bridge and how the cross bridges between uh, the fallen man and, and the, the, our creator. But it just struck me last night, as I was going over that again, that um, the huge gulf that was, that was spanned because God left his side and he came over to our side because there's no way for us to go from our side over to his side. It doesn't matter how good we are doesn't matter how wealthy we are, doesn't matter how loving and kind and sweet we are, we're just not capable of going from man's human humanity, the side of humanity, to the side of God. And it, it, it struck me again how awesome it is to be a child of God because it frees me from working so hard to try to attain something that's absolutely unattainable because he came over to us, And that Jesus, then, is the manifestation of God-man. So that those who believe in Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the sacrifice, then, we can have this peace with God. We can have the life that he intended us to have because of this incarnation. So the next few weeks, um, we're going to begin a study from the book of Luke. This is kind of a precursor to set us up for it. Uh, Dr. Luke took some, did some research, teaches us about this child that we're going to be looking or celebrating during the season, who is the Son of God, who is Emmanuel, who is God in our midst, God with us. That word or name, Emmanuel, is only mentioned three times in the Scripture. Twice in two chapters of Isaiah and once in the book of Matthew. So <clears throat> we'll take a look at that a little bit today to set us up for what it means then when we begin to study Dr. Luke's research on the life of Jesus Christ and what it is he's trying to get across to us in the message that God came here to live with us. Let's look first of all at what Emmanuel means to Isaiah. If you look at the scripture, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 10. It's up on your screen. This is the first instance in which the word Emmanuel is used. So we read, again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. He said, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as shoal or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. The background for this story is, um, actually you'll find it in the book of Chronicles and also the book of Kings. Hezekiah, uh, not Hezekiah, uh, uh, um, Hezekiah was the son of Ahaz, I, and Je Je Jehoash. Anyway, uh, Ahaz's dad was a good man, solid man. Ahaz's man was a righteous man and a good king. His son came along named Ahaz, and uh, Ahaz then uh, didn't follow in his father's path, didn't follow in the path of David, and uh, went his own way. In fact, his, the story is told about how after having defeated 
he, he had joined forces with uh, the king of Assyria. And after having defeated Israel uh, in Assyria, in Damascus, he saw this <clears throat> altar in where they had sacrificed to their God. Now get this, you know, I mean, he's the conquering king. And yet he sees an altar in which they made sacrifices to their king, but they're the ones who lost. So their king or their, their God, well, he didn't win the win for them, but, but uh, he sees their altar, and it must be a cool-looking altar. He says, that'll look good in our temple. And he brings it in, he sets it up in the temple and gets rid of the one that's uh, uh, in, in, in Jerusalem there and uh, makes some changes and so forth. And they begin, he instructs the priests then to begin sacrificing on this foreign altar in which idols had been worshipped. Well, <clears throat> there were also a lot of people in Jerusalem who didn't take too kindly to that either. But now there's news of an impending invasion. Where we find ourselves in this scripture is two guys, uh, Rezer and, and um, Pekah, uh, the king of Syria and the king of uh, Israel, have been after Ahaz to make a decision because there's this king from Assyria here who is gaining this power and he's become very formidable and there's this, this rumors and, and thoughts that he's going to be coming down and they need the forces. Well, Ahaz keeps fuzzing about, you know, he just doesn't make a decision. So the king of Assyria, uh, the king of Syria, uh, uh, Rezer and Pekah, they decide to join forces to force Judah then to join them and fight against the Assyrians. Now, <clears throat> Ahaz is making plans. So we find him in this chapter, if you begin with verse 1, at the out at the checking out the water supply because he knows what's going to happen. There's going to be, uh, um, they're, they're going to cut off Jerusalem so nobody gets in and out. He needs to be sure of the water supply. God says to Isaiah, Isaiah, go find Ahaz at the, <clears throat> the head of this conduit, and I want you to give him some encouragement. So, you know, I mean, Ahaz has a reputation for being an ungodly fella. He has a reputation for idolatry. Yet God says to his prophet, I want you to go to him and give him words of encouragement. So Isaiah goes to find him. And uh, he sent to him to give him a message from God. I want you to notice a couple things very quickly. Notice the messenger is a prophet and not a priest. In the Old Testament, the priest is the one who would be the messenger from God. But the priest has been so corrupted now that they're not hearing anything from God, that God has called up certain men like Samuel, beginning with him, and a school of prophets like Elijah and Elisha and some of these prophets, who then are the spokesmen for God because the priests don't hear what God's going through, what God's saying. They've just become very automatic in their, in, in their uh, ritual, and it's lost all communion and fellowship with God. That happens. But God always has a spokesman. So he calls Isaiah to be this prophet. And he, we, we see here that the presence of God in the Old Testament is distinctly different from today. And that in, in that day, God was in a particular location. But today, he, he's within us, but we also have this community together which, in which we enjoy the presence of God. So he's told by God to go and give encouragement. And very quickly, he gives him seven bits of encouragement. In uh, chapter 7, verse 3, he says... Um, this is my son. His name is Shir Yashub. Shir Yashub. He's a remnant, which means a remnant shall return. That was to be assigned to Ahaz. Listen, God told me to name my son that name, and it means a remnant shall return. So take heart. He gives him another word of encouragement by giving him four commands. Two are positive. He says, take care and be calm. Two are negative. He says, have no fear and do not be faint-hearted. It suggests to the king, then, in this encouragement, you've got nothing to worry about. Stay the course. You'll come out all right. The third bit of encouragement is brought through the metaphor in which he calls pika and resin the smoldering firebrands. In other words, they're, they're, they're ready to go out at any moment. So you don't have to worry about them. They're, they're not going to be any danger. In chapter 7, verse 7, the fourth bit of encouragement, he conveys this by giving him a promise that the plot to overthrow the kingdom of David is absolutely not going to succeed. It will fail. So Ahaz, yes, you're preparing for battle. Yes, they're going to come. But take courage. God's going to 
despite your wickedness, he's going to uphold you and uphold the Davidic dynasty. The fifth bit of encouragement is a longer range prediction that Ephraim is going to cease to be as a people in chapter 7, verse 8. The sixth encouragement Isaiah gives to him is, a, is an analysis of the situation. He says, both of these adversaries, both Pekah and Rezin, both Syria and, Damas uh, and um, uh, Israel, they have human heads, human leaders over them. But you, in fact, have the leadership of God. God has sent me to tell you that God is going to direct you. Finally, the prophet, uh, prophet offers a very simple plan by which Ahaz then might escape the dangers of this syro uh, Ephraimic invasion the, between the, uh, from the Syrians and the Israelites as they're coming down to invade him. And all the king has to do is to believe. You just have to believe that what I said is true. And so Isaiah says to him, Ahaz, as a sign of your belief and your faith, choose a sign from God. Name any one of them. It can be as deep as hell. It can be as high as the heavens. But you call the sign, your sign. And Ahaz, seemingly very um, pious, steps back and says, oh, no, I, I'm not going to test God. I'm not going to do that. But in fact, Ahaz isn't being pious at all. He's actually being rather rebellious because he has already de decided that he's going to pursue a political solution. He's going to join the Assyrians. And so he's asking the Assyrians then to come down and to attack Israel and Syria for him, with him. And that way he'd take care of his enemy. It was a good idea, and actually it worked, until the Assyrians then turned on Ahaz and came after him. And, and, and uh, in chapter 8, Isaiah then says, instead of choosing the, the flowing river, uh, the, the flowing river that I've offered you, Instead, what's going to happen is the river, he says, which is the Assyrian forces are going to come through and just wipe this place out. But he says, the river or the water will only rise up to your neck. What he was saying is, you'll be okay. You'll be okay. So now, <clears throat> Isaiah gives this prophecy and says, Hear then, O house of Israel, a house of David, is it too little for you to weary men? that you weary my God also. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So this defiant rejection of God's offer of, of a sign of his own faith in God, he turns it away and he tries the patience by saying to him, I'm going to do it myself. I have a method. I'm going to do it my own way. Well, <clears throat> I ask you the question. Because Isaiah asks Ahaz, is it too little for you to weary men with your pettiness that you then will weary my God also? And so is our faith then so small? Is our faith by being so small a burden upon the greatness of God? Now, I use this mm, carefully because how do we burden God? But God, we, we do because he carries, he carries our sin burdens, but we can weary God. Isaiah also says to them at one time, he says, why is it that in your behavior you continue to weary God? We can make God weary of our pettiness and of our cavalier attitude. We can make God weary because we don't, appreciate him for his greatness and his goodness and just the vastness of, of God. We should ask ourselves the question, do we belittle God with our insignificant and small requests for little favors? Uh, God, please bless us today. Help the weather to be good. Really? Oh, God, I'm really tired of this rain and this cold. We should give us some sun. You know, I mean, like, that's going to really change the world that we're in. And I just wonder, when we come to God with these, God, please do me this favor, would you? And can you do this for us? Maybe he's saying, come on. 
like to Ahaz. Listen, ask of me a sign. Let it be as deep as hell. Let it be as high as heaven. Remember there was another king who also had the opportunity to choose a sign? And he said, I would like the sundial to go back <coughs> several degrees. Now that's pretty cool. You can't, it's not like turning your watch back, you know. I mean, you can just take and just turn it back several hours. But he says, no, I want you to turn the sundial back several degrees. Yeah, now I think that that's, I think that's what Ahaz was thinking about, uh, 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 Isaiah was thinking about here. But uh, he missed the opportunity. In fact, is he got really pious, you know, and said, no, 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 that's all right. I'm not going to test God. Uh, who am I to test God? And really the idea is, who are we not to test him? Because God challenges us in the book of, in book of Malachi. He says, try now, test me now, check me out now. And this was only regarding the tithe and giving the 10%. And he was saying, you guys, you, you're stealing from me. You're not giving that. And, and, and he's just challenging them. And he says, why don't you put me to the test and see if I don't open up the windows of heaven? I, I get the impression that God would enjoy a challenge. Now, there's a thought. What could we think of that might challenge God? And it seems as if he's saying to us, you know, nobody's ever really, nobody's ever really testing me out. They're asking me for this little stuff, you know, and, and, uh, and, and nothing really big. Do we really live as though God is in our midst? Or is he just kind of a distant observer to the miserly little life that we go through? I mean, is he here? Does he care? Does he want us to, to, to live life to the fullest and... and, and do we take the opportunity to say, hey, God, here's, check this out. Here's something for you to do. It's something that's beyond our ability. And we ask God to do the impossible. I mean, the really impossible. So when Ahaz says, okay, I'm not going to ask for a sign, God says, all right, buddy, I'll show you. I'll choose a sign. So... This one wasn't turning back the sun several degrees. This one says, I'm going to bring forth a child from a virgin womb. Okay? Try that one out, huh? I dare you. It's like God saying to Ahaz, see if you can top that. It's not going to happen. And God then, as we come down through the ages and through the years, he says that this child is going to be called Emmanuel. Because only God can do this. And so if only God can do this, this has got to be a special child. This child is going to be God with us. So to Isaiah, what does Emmanuel mean? To Isaiah, Emmanuel is a sign of God's promise of salvation. God is going to save his people. And he was trying to get Ahaz to understand, listen, I'm trying to get you to know that God is here to, to protect you and to save you from these attacking hordes. Now, you're not going to put the challenge to him. God's going to choose the challenge. Here's what it's going to be. A baby is going to be born of a virgin. Call his name Emmanuel because that is how God has chosen to enter into our world. Of all the ways he could have chosen, that was what he chose to come as a helpless child in Bethlehem. So now let's look at the book of Matthew and see what Matthew has to say about Emmanuel. The, 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 uh, by the way, very quickly, first time was what we read in Isaiah chapter 7. Second time he mentions I may, uh, uh, Emmanuel in Isaiah chapter 8 and having again to do with God's uh, deliverance. Now we come to uh, Matthew chapter 1 and uh, reading from verse 18, here's what the scriptures tell us. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which conceive, is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, 
and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So in the New Testament, we, we see a story that's being told to us through different eyes. The one side, we see the eyes through the story through the eyes of Matthew, which would be through the eyes of Joseph. And, and think about it for a moment. Uh, the, the other side of, is when we look at the book of Luke, which is where we're going to look, and that's looking at this birthing uh, uh, event through the eyes of Mary. But through the eyes of Joseph for a moment, you're, you're really in love with this girl, okay? You're getting ready to marry her. In fact, as you've been betrothed. She's quite young, and so the marriage so ceremony hasn't taken place, but she's, she's your wife. You just haven't taken possession of her yet. And then, uh, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? <clears throat> uh, Old-fashioned way of talking, okay, ladies? <laughs> uh, don't, don't get upset here. So, so he's, he's waiting for the marriage to take place in which, this, uh, which their union is going to be consummated. And, and what he finds out, though, is, and I, you know, uh, Mary being the girl that, that we were told about her, just being one who's very much in tune with God, very much in tune with the Spirit of God. And um, I, I just wonder... I don't think she waited until she was showing. I think she may have gone and told Joseph, who would have been a confidant at that time, to where, what's going on in her life and what's happening, and said, hey, Joseph, an angel came to me. And uh, he says, I'm going to be carrying the Son of God, and so um, I'm pregnant. And Joseph is going, whoa, Really? That doesn't play too well. What am I going to tell my parents? Have you told yours? What are we going to do about this? I mean, can you imagine what's going to happen, Mary, when, when, the, when the community finds out that you're heavy with baby and we're not even married and, and, and even, even then it's not mine. I didn't do this. So, you know, I mean, Joseph feels very innocent, and obviously he should. So it's like, man, what, what am I going to do here? It, it must have been a crushing blow for him. Because, I, again, I, from what we can tell, very little of what we know about Joseph. He seems to have been a, 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 a righteous old chap, a young chap. And so he, he, um, he's got to deal with his reputation now. So he thinks the best thing to do, like many of us do, is if I just quietly put it away, maybe it'll go away. How does a pregnant teenager just go away? You know, I mean, how do you just say, not me? Uh, it doesn't. It, it doesn't. So he's very much disturbed about this whole thing and what's going to come of it. And it's at that time that the angel comes to Joseph then and begins to tell him what's, what's going on. And he tells Joseph that what Mary told you is true. And not only that, that baby she carries is called Emmanuel, which is God with us. Now, I have to say this. Uh, if you'll notice carefully, that wasn't part of the message that the angel gave to Emmanuel. That was written by Matthew uh, that the angel gave to Joseph. Uh, the, the story, the bit about Emmanuel and what it means, that's something that Moses wrote later when he's retelling the story. So, uh, gosh, what am I saying? Not Moses. Uh, uh, it's something that Matthew, uh, uh, my mind's just going, anyway, it's not, uh, I'm going to, okay, just want to see if you're listening. So, here, here's the deal. It's Joseph, okay? He didn't hear from that message from the angel. The message that he, heard, that he heard was about the fact that they're going to call his name Emmanuel. The part that was added by Matthew is a part that's God with us, which brings it back to the connection in Isaiah. Matthew's the only one who makes this connection. Nobody made this connection before Matthew. So uh, there's a lot of questions as to whether or not Matthew made up the story so that he could make the connection. There's a lot of people who don't believe that the, the Gospels are right. They think that they're fabricated. Well, here's a question. If, if this story is fabricated, 
why would then, if we're going to write a story about this great teacher, this great influential person named Jesus, why would we tell about his bastard birth? Sorry for the language, folks, but you know, I mean, that's, that's kind of how most people would look at it. In, in, a, in a very secular world, or even, a, 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 I should say, not even a secular world, in a very religious world, you have a child born out of wedlock, that's a big deal. And they have names for children born out of wedlock. Because it's offensive. And in being offensive in that way, the question we'd, we'd have to ask ourselves, why would you want to tell that story? Why would you make that up then to, and to, to tell this story? Why would you just, if, if, if the whole thing's a fabrication, why would you fabricate his illegitimate birth? Doesn't make sense. The reason it's in there is because it's the truth. They wanted the truth about Jesus to be known because they realized both Luke and Matthew write about it. Mark doesn't write about the birth. But they wanted the truth to be known because they believed the story to be true. They believed that this story about Jesus and his uh, unusual birth and, having, and, and the unusual uh, decision that Joseph made, all of this came together then to be part of the story of Jesus and to be the unusual person that he was. This story, though, that in the Gospels about the, the virgin birth, it doesn't have to stand on its own. In fact, we accept this event of the incarnation in light of the entire history of the Jews, what they were looking for. They've been looking for this for many, many years. We have the, the, the account of, um, uh, of um, Elizabeth, John and Elizabeth. We also have the account of... Um, the other disciples, then we also have the apostles and their story of their encounter with Jesus, what happened with them afterwards. We have the story of Paul that we talked about uh, last week and his encounter with Jesus and how that radically changed his life. And all down through history, we have the story of this one named Jesus and people who have had a personal encounter with him have had a fundamental change in their life. And it's had a, a huge effect on this world that we know. So this whole, this whole story, we don't, we don't need to take it and set it aside and, and put it to the, the test. We can put it in the whole perspective of his story to see that even 2,000 years later and in a season that's dedicated, supposedly, to the birth of Jesus Christ, it makes this story even more likely to be true than false. The name Jesus is a very popular name. It's the Hebrew name. The Hebrew name is Joshua. The Joshua's any Joshua's in here? Not this week. There was a Joshua last week. Is he out there? Ah, okay, in the classroom we have a Joshua. Anyway, his name, in properly said, could be Jesus. A lot of, in Spanish, a lot of Jesus. A very popular name. So, Jesus, Joshua, Jesus, um, <clears throat> Not too many, I don't know too many Westerners name or uh, uh, folks from America named Jesus. Probably not in Australia too many Jesus people either. I mean, who names their child Jesus? But they do in the Spanish countries, a lot of them. And uh, Hispanic countries, yes. And, and uh, of course, if you named your child Joshua, it's the same thing as naming him Jesus. So how's that? <clears throat> but he's given another name. And this other name that he uses is the name Emmanuel. God is among us, the rescuing people from helplessness. And for Matthew, the name Emmanuel was God among us. It's the deliverance of God into our midst, to dwelling with us. Now, think about it. This is the God, and this is the Jesus who comes to us today, today. When all human possibilities have run out, he comes to us today offering a new and startling way to go forward in fulfillment of his promises in which by his powerful love and by his powerful grace, he has made known to us. This God and this Jesus. 
So during this season, what I would like for us to do is simply to reflect on what God means to you. What does it mean to say, I believe in God, I follow God, I trust in God, I have faith in God? Right, so what does that, what does that mean? I mean, is it just kind of a religious thing that we, kind of, we, we, do some, we go through some activities and we do the Sunday morning at 9 a.m. thing, you know? And uh, that's kind of our, that's our God thing. Is that what God means to us? If God's living, which I can't imagine a God being dead. He wouldn't have been God if he's dead, right? So, so God's living, what effect does that have on you and me? What difference does it make to us whatsoever? If could be that there's this huge infinite gap between us and God. We don't, we don't sense that there's any kind of connection. The only connection between us and God is through the God-man, Jesus. The incarnation. So reflect on what it means to, to us when we say, God is with us. And ask ourselves the questions again. How about my faith? Is my faith so small as to be a laughing point to God? No, I don't think God laughs at our faith. But really, can we put God to the test? Can, can we put a challenge to God? Maybe we can challenge God with what, he, with what He wants us to do with our life for Him. He gave us life. He gave us abilities. He's given us the place in which we can serve Him. Wherever you're at, that's where God's placed you. It's a gift that God's given to you as a, something you can do to serve Him. The air we breathe, the life that we live, it's a gift from God. Ask ourselves, God, how can you use me in this? Put a challenge out. How can we have an effect on our community here? How can we change our community and, and change our, our, even the culture to become more Christ-like? Jesus came to save the world. He fully intends, he's fully capable of doing that, but he intended to do it through us. Do we really live like God is with us? Or is he merely a distant observer? How far away are we? You know, when we think of Jesus in the manger, it's kind of soft and warm and cuddly, isn't it? It's not too dangerous at all, that little baby in a manger. But I'll tell you, when we look at the resurre resurrected Christ, we think about the power of Almighty God in our presence, it should be a frightening thought. I think we're far more comfortable with the soft little baby in the manger than we are with the King of kings and Lord of lords, creator of the universe. Pause to reflect on the one true God who walks with us. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Fathers, we come to you in prayer today. We, we do need to ask ourselves, how are we living in your presence? Do we actually need you at all? I mean, would it be possible to live our lives without you being a part of it at all? Can we say that uh, we walk by faith and that uh, if you're not with us, we, we just wouldn't be able to make it? So, you know, as we... So we enjoy the, 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 uh, the season and uh, the happiness of the season. Help us at the same time to reflect on this is the Jesus who died on the cross for me that I might then take his message and tell others about what Jesus Christ has done for me. And let us do that this season, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I'm going to ask the ushers to please um, uh, pass out these cards again like we did last week and, and bring in the uh, offering envelopes. Do you have any more of these cards? Uh, I'll tell you what we did last week. And, and um, of course, if you were here last week, that was good. And, and I want to say this, church, last week what we did was um, made a commitment to what we're going to do and be a part of missions. Many of you were here last week and you participated. Some of you are here this week and weren't able to participate. So I, I, I want you to have the opportunity because, um, again, this is part of that challenge. Is can God use this little grace church? I mean, 
we have maybe 80 to 100 adults. Can, can God use us then to make a profound impact on this, uh, uh, on our community and this society? I, I'm not going to be very long, even though I'm sitting down, okay? Don't, don't, don't get nervous. <laughs> so, uh, here's the thing. We've been talking for a whole month about missions. Last week, we kind of brought it to a close, and, and uh, I wanted folks to have, also have an opportunity. Last week, uh, to, to the credit of those who are here, we, there was over... Um, Actually, it was $44,000 a month that was, uh, and that's NT dollars, $44,000 NT dollars a month that was committed to missions over and above the regular offering, over and above our regular budget. Yeah, that's tremendous. Uh, then uh, we also decided as a church then that we were going to take our, our um, income from last year, take 10% of that, and that's what we would add then to missions so that our whole church will be a part of giving the missions too. And uh, if you weren't a part, go ahead and pass those out. Um, and my suggestion is everybody just take a card, okay? Uh, don't, don't say, oh, I did this last week. Everybody just take a card, and, and you can, if you, if you uh, gave last week, that's fine. If you want to give some more, you can add some more. But um, I'd like for our, our church to be very much involved, not only in our community, but also in places like where we've had some people visiting in Philippines, uh, also in places like Nepal, uh, where we've bought property and we bought a church. I, I, I mean, uh, I put up a build, helped put up a building. Actually, we helped put up the building, I think is what we did. But th the church is going well there. And there's an orphanage there at that same place. Uh, Dave Freeman and I, when we were there, we, we uh, spent the night in the orphanage there. The same people run that orphanage in Nepal as also run the orphanage there in Borkai, the uh, First Love Ministries. So... Um, we also have an opportunity to be involved in, with, in Germany with Henry and Eve. Uh, they're out of our church. Uh, next year, I want them to become and, and be a part of our missions outreach too. So this is all because people give. All I'm asking you to do is this. On the back of the card, it says, my next step today is, and then there are certain things. Uh, you, don't, you can tick one of those or not tick one of those, but I'd like you to just put on there, if you haven't participated, just put on there how much you would be willing to give to missions on a monthly basis, to give to the, to the outreach of the gospel, either with our hands, our feet, either with our, and certainly through our heart, but by being actively involved in taking the gospel message to our community and also places around the world. Uh, it can be any amount that God lays on your heart. And please don't sign your name. Please, if you sign your name, get another card. Because I, it's, to me, I, it's, uh, it's really something that's between you and God anyway. So I don't feel like uh, I need to come checking up on you, so don't put your name on that. Uh, it's something that uh, you need to put between you and God and say, this is my part, this is what I'd like to be part, uh, involved in. And if for just, just do what God lays on your heart. That's all I'm asking you to do. If it's not, uh, not now, maybe it's later. Whatever God. And then what we're going to do, the ushers are going to come with the offering bags. And uh, at this time, we'll, we'll collect our offering and uh, also put those cards then in there. Uh, I'll announce again next week what, um, we've, what our total is for missions. And then it helps us then as leadership to be able to budget what we're going to do for missions in the coming year. All right? Reminder, if you'd like to um, pick up a Christmas flower, they're certainly available. You might say, well, Pastor, you sure are talking a lot about money lately. It's nothing new, folks. <clears throat> All I have to say is you, you, you try and pay the electric company without cash and see how that works. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to help people who... We have resources and they don't. So... They have needs, we have needs too, but we oftentimes can meet our needs. They can't meet their needs, so let's be a part of helping people meet their needs. Uh, all right, let's stand, please. And um, we do have snacks available. Appreciate, again, your, your patience. And uh, just a reminder, we're going to be meeting upstairs next week, and uh, it'll be at 9 a.m., okay? Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we gathered around your word. And uh, I pray that... Uh, uh, like when Isaiah came to King Ahaz, Lord, that you might impress upon us that you, you thrill for a challenge. You would love to prove yourself and who you are. And I pray that our lives might be such that we would 
uh, desire to see the hand of God obviously at work in our midst. Use Grace Church, I pray. Use it to bring glory to your name. Use us to bring the message to others who don't have a chance to hear it. And use us, Lord, to show Jesus by what we do, not just what we say. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, have a great snack time. Oh.
Whoa, good morning. Glad you're here this morning. Whoa, good morning. Glad you're here this morning. Merry Christmas to you. We're in that season of uh, joy and mirth, at least for most people. <laughs> yeah. Is that um, Jared? 